thank you for, uh, for inviting us to, uh, to continue the discussion over the Pazinelli index in the sense when we started, uh, we started yesterday. We're just going to, I'll continue to do a Goyer when this gets here. It's, uh, it's actually part of a, of a whole picture. And uh, and when we when we did ask us to actually uh, do something, I, I thought I should go back to uh, originally what we were doing. If you go back to these papers that were you know, 1980, uh, all of them were really concerned about the cyclical aspect, because of course it's the cyclical side that gives you ultimately, you know, it's it's, it's, it's the think of it as the income distribution channel of monetary policy that, that matters. So we wanted to, in a sense, address that concern, and uh, and we've done some some exercise here. Uh, now, so what's the objective here? Obviously, it's to look at the kind of long-term evolution, but also the cyclical effects, which we believe were are critically important in understanding how we could actually frame the uh, overall macroeconomic cost. Now, should the Pazinelli index be some kind of Simple rule here, like in my back, as you, I was asking you man, about the idea that some were leaving there, or is it, uh, is, or should it be addressed uh, somewhat differently? <clears throat> Where it, it, it kind of adapts to some long term level or not? <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, there, there's been uh, some debate, in fact, literally between Mark and I over that, I should say. You know, the, during the pandemic, because you know, once the inflation rates start to pick up and there's seeing real interest rates plunging badly, should we be, in fact, be quickly adapting you know, to, to the Pazinetti rate, there, which I, I thought it would be disaster. <laughs> you know, to do. And so we had differences of opinion about that. And I think, uh, well, not totally. I mean, I don't think we completely disagree, it's just that the timing here is important, if you want to call it that. Okay? And in that regard, I would say that we should have a, there's a kind of adaptation process here because, of course, uh, uh, this whole issue about short term policy over longer term horizon is, not, is really the, the issue. Now, <clears throat> excuse me. I, you know, obviously, uh, other than being taken in itself as a norm, as we were arguing earlier, it has to do with uh, how it impacts on income distribution and its effect of that in income distribution change, whether it's directly on volunteer shares. And also, there are also secondary effects it has on the wage profit relationships or the wage shares that, that has further or secondary effects that then compound it in a certain direction or other the, the overall effect of that policy on either real growth rates uh, or uh, unemployment, of course. Now, if that idea, as I was saying earlier, that if you look at the stuff that we were doing in the was that was really the, one of the key elements of that I was trying to understand the cyclical side of it. Okay? And uh, showing how, the, in fact, these uh, interest rates can influence how you get spending in the economy. Now, uh, oops, let me just, uh, uh, I think I jumped something here. Yeah, wait, sorry. How come I jumped so far? <laughs> okay. No, it's not. It's the last button that allows you to reset. Okay, I'm sorry, but. Uh, Oh, okay. I don't know what happened. I'm sorry, but I just sort of jumped there. Let me go. Oh, no, but, but it's fine. Oh, it's fine now? Well, I'm, I'm at the right place. Oh, okay. No, sorry. No. I, uh, I, I thought I was dreaming. <laughs> Anyways, I um, so just to get back to this, as I said, if you look at the kind of work that we were doing there, there was that cyclical side that is also important. And, and there are some consequences in the way you adapt that policy model. Yes. Okay. Now, let's see if you go the right way. Okay, well, in terms of the way we're going to treat this, of course, is we're going to look at these long historical series of the world. But Guillermo will be looking at it more detail. Because he did all the empirical work. I'm not going to even <laughs> start yet. But 
he does look at the various measures. We do look at the, either the traditional, so-called traditional PI versus the labor command one, and then also look at certain indicators in terms of labor shared unemployment as well. And it's done through a recursive bar model, the, the collection that we're going to look at the impacts. Okay. Now the history, well, ever since we if you go back there to the, uh, when we had proposed a, a little bit starting in the mid to late 1980s, as we were talking about there uh, with Mark yesterday, uh, the objective was ultimately to establish some sort of a, a norm here for monetary policy uh, by securing what I would call long-term stability between the wrong tier, non wrong tier shares of, of the national economy. And uh, the the research, uh, the kind of research that we were doing at the time really arose in part also because of the breakdown of was what at the time was still widely regarded as the stylized facts a la Calder about the stability of the relative shares. And obviously, literally during that period of the 1980s, we started seeing a lot of debate over how they were breaking down. Okay? Breaking down not only because of the wage share being affected, you know, the wage productivity relationship that everybody is you know, talking about later in terms of the bifurcation between the evolution of real wages and productivity, but also, of course, <clears throat> excuse me, also the run tier income, okay? how it just exploded during that whole period of the 1980s, you know, after the Balfour shock and so on. Okay? So in that regard, we were trying to address that concern. And now, what we were also trying to do was to sort of see how we could anchor monetary policy in such a way that it could provide these relative stability of these shares, ultimately, in order to reestablish what was supposedly the stylized facts of the early post-war period, okay, which was a different conjecture, different period. Now, the, the way in which we, as you know, the way in which we started off with this was to look at it, it's a bit analogous to the link between real wage and productivity growth that, that was already well understood and popular as a kind of way of establishing the wage share situation and so on in the 1950s and the 60s. Okay. And the original was to uh, obviously to equalize the real rate of interest, okay, which we argue can be a, a, you know, established, uh, determined you know, exogenously by the central bank, uh, to the rate of productivity growth, or of course, to the real wage growth if you're doing the labor command that we were talking about. Now, and this, of course, in the medium and long term. Okay? Uh, which again, when you also couple that with the labor market side of it, you know, in terms of incomes policies of real wage productivity growth, you can provide a, a kind of broad stability over time. Now, are those fair? Well, it depends where you start with, but the point is, can we establish that kind of stability? And we thought that it would be possible. So either by R equal to rho, you know, the productivity, when rho is productivity, or that little W there, that the Greek W, <laughs> actually, this could uh, tell me how to pronounce it, but I don't know. Uh, the, uh, it would be R equals that. Uh, now, <clears throat> excuse me, or in a kind of freeway sense, you get this whole version that we even talked about in 2019, as, uh, as we heard earlier. Now, in those uh, studies, okay, it was the income distribution channel of the monetary policy, which was identified as, I think I touched it It's just to, it's just this thing. I'm sorry, I, mean, I, I want to move them. No, but, but this, uh, it does by itself. Okay. Uh, yeah, this is the so uh, the again we have here this channel of monetary policy that, as I said, we emphasize that Mark and I had been emphasizing at the time, uh, and see how it could have the both, as I said, short term but long term impact on, on macro performance. And the short term variation of that index 
can really impact now through uh, monetary policy on income distribution uh, directly on this share, but also indirectly on this wage share or wage profit kind of shares in the economy. They all could do it both directly and indirectly, and then ultimately uh, to you know, its impact on, on GDP growth or whatever, an employment in the economy. Now, what precise mechanism are we talking about? I got it right. Okay. Uh, now, obviously, there's the one which I would say is a traditional mechanism that, that the neoclassics also talked about, and they emphasize, of course, you know, the mainstream here, uh, which is that you know it, it, it does impact on what we could call the interest elastic components of private spending in the economy. I mean, there is some of that. Now, how important <coughs> is one, of course, is that the post Keynesians argue that that mechanism is very weak or next to zero, but almost zero, but not zero exactly, okay? When it comes to, uh, especially to these non-incremental, I call discontinuous jumps here in, in interest rates that could impact on some major components of uh, especially business spending, but it's extremely weak. Uh, I mean, we know that it's a general theory kind of thing. I don't think anybody would deny that. Uh, but there is another side where it is very significant, which is, of course, the residential or household investment side, uh, where we know housing market is extremely sensitive, both directly to interest rates, but also indirectly to what I would call the kind of asset price effect, speculative kind of effect that feeds into it as well. Okay, So that there it is important, I would argue. I don't think people would question that to be in advice. Yeah. Maybe not the decision whether you're going to build a new plant somewhere, let's say General Motors or whatever it is, yeah. but but we do know that a housing market is very sensitive to that, you know, significantly so, right? But there's the other side too. This is the kind of what I would call the pure post Keynesian income distribution uh, channel here or, or transmission mechanism, yeah. which is, of course, uh, hypothesized, as we say, there to be much more significant. And because, of course, we know for a fact that the, the share of consumption out of the economy is very large. And indeed, we know that that could impact, you know, if you have the, the differential propensities, you know, because of the differential propensities to consume or to save between, let's say, rentier and workers, for instance, we know, of course, that the, you know, the savings rate, I mean, this goes back to all this literature from Polatsky, the all the classical kind of literature historically, and of course, Caldo, Robinson, Paginetti, and so on, who emphasize the fact that we have the French consumer to consumer to save it. And the fact that we have that, of course, means that you're going to have some impact through that mechanism that we're talking about. How significant we think it's very significant. Moreover, as that economy uh, does fluctuate uh, over time, there's a kind of potential indirect impact, of course, because if it impacts on employment, yeah, then you get these secondary effects in the labor market side that further could compound the effects. You know, of the, you have to call that the second round here kind of mechanism uh, of the PI. Now I'll let the uh, you have 15 uh, oh good well we have 15 minutes. minutes yeah so in terms of the empirical strategy uh, the first thing we did was actually like looking at the paper that Mario and Mark wrote in 2016, there is a paper he's uh, on passing a big index change and where they talk about the PKF again. They they have this very long series on the passing a big index. When we we went back, we look at the historical statistics in Canada and also in the United States, and we were able to take uh, to get some measures of the passing a big index. I think in, in that paper, Mario and Mark got the, uh, the traditional passing the index with uh, output per worker. Uh, but in this case, we were able to get also the labor command passing the index. This is for Canada. Um, obviously, so this is historical statistics going back to 1927. 
uh, it's just annual data uh, until 2021. And this is what we got. Uh, the continuous line is the, the traditional facility index, and then the dashed line is the uh, labor demand facility index. This is for Canada. And here we can uh, see uh, clearly uh, like this uh, voltage policy here starting uh, in the early 80s. Uh, we also have this uh, very uh, volatile period uh, related to the uh, Inter war period. So, and also, like more recently, we get this uh, Fascinetti index. So, we have these two very interesting periods where the Fascinetti index, both niche measures, are uh, more or less uh, stable. stable. Um, and we also look at uh, the United States. As well, historical statistics in the United States uh, going back to 1935 until 2022. And we get now, uh, since like this is a bit uh, different because in, in Canada, it, uh, we have uh, before the uh, Great Depression, and the Great Depression really makes things very volatile. But in this case, uh, it starts in 1935, so uh, the scale is a bit different. That's why it, it, it looks a bit different, but in fact, they, are, they behave very similarly as compared to Canada. So here again, we have these. Oh, sorry. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's the okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 What we what John Smith thinks called the revenge of the rentier, and we also have this uh, more recent period, and here the more or less stable period uh, after the Second World War. Um, then we have the also the unemployment rates over time, the evolution of the unemployment rate in Canada from 1926 to 2022, and uh, we uh, have like similar process for the for instance, we have this uh, trend, like software trend in the unemployment rate, with, which can be associated here. Here, when we have this uh, very high unemployment rate, it's uh, it, it points, well, no, it goes hand in hand with the period where the passing of the index is relatively high. Um, then we also have for the United States, similar more or less uh, behavior. And um, we have as well the labor shares. This is for Canada from 1926 to 2021. And we have this, uh, let's say, uh, after, especially after the Second World War, we have this uh, upward trend in the labor share. And then uh, starting at the beginning of the 80s, we and start to see this uh, declining uh, labor share. And then uh, after the global financial crisis, it kind of stabilizes. This is for Canada, and this is as well for the US. This is also starting from 1935, which changes a bit the, the scale, but the behavior is more or less uh, similar in the sense that after the Second World War, we see this uh, upward trend in the labor share, and then uh, starting more or less in, in the uh, late 70s and early 80s, we, we see a decline in the labor share. And then after the global financial crisis, the labor share stabilizes. <laughs> okay, so uh, obviously this is a, a work in progress. So with this data, what then should we do to try to at least have some measures of the impact of the passing energy index on the um, in, on income distribution, and we also have the unemployment rate. And we uh, to do that, we run a recursive bar model, which uh, is uh, similar to uh, the one that we saw yesterday uh, that Chris uh, presented. And um, we uh, have these uh, three variables. The wage productivity growth gap, 
the unemployment rate and the fascinating index. We both use the labor command and the uh, traditional fascinating measure. And in this case, we have uh, the wage productivity growth graph, which is uh, analogous to the rate of change in the labor share. You know? uh, the, the ordering of the orthogonalized higher Fs. Gap and then the unemployment rate in third place. We obviously carry out these rows in FDS where we change the order of the variables to see if they impact well the other way around. And um, yes, it, uh, we also uh, carry out some grandeur causality tests to justify, in a way, the order of the variables. And as well, uh, we have this uh, theoretical framework that is based on endogenous money and the uh, exogenous uh, interest rate uh, and administered interest rates. And, um, okay, so we have these bar models with one lag according to this criteria. And the period involves this report Canada is from 1928 to 2021 and towards uh, the United States from 1931 to 2022. And what we've got here is, um, yeah, this one. This is like the uh, IRS for Canada. Uh, obviously, the diagonal is the the impact of the variable on itself. In this case, is the um, the PI, the unemployment rate, and the wage gap. But the interesting thing here is the impact of the fascinating index on the unemployment rate. Also, the impact of the fascinating index on the wage. Uh, Productivity growth gap, which productivity growth gap on the unemployment rate. And to see this more clearly, we have here the impact of the fascinating index on the first of the uh, wage productivity growth gap. And you see that there is this is the impact of a one percentage point increase in the fascinating index. And how does that impact the wage productivity growth gap? Well, it seems that there is a, an impact, a decrease in the wage productivity growth gap, which, which means that the labor share uh, uh, decreases. And this impact uh, is significant for the first uh, four periods. And we also have uh, the impact of the passivity index on the unemployment rate. And this is a, like a very long, long lasting impact that uh, covers like, the first seven years and then here is much smaller which is the impact of the wage for the growth gap on the unemployment rate which means that one percent of increase in the wage for the growth gap reduces the unemployment yes like you say thank you yeah it's, it's fine and this is for the united states and um, interestingly we get very similar results for instance, this is uh, the impact of the fascinating index on the wage productivity growth gap, which is the same. It reduces the wage productivity growth gap. And uh, in terms of the impact on the unemployment rate, it's the same, like a similar long lasting impact on the unemployment rate for about seven years. And as well, in the case of the impact of the wage productivity growth gap or the change in the labor share on the unemployment rate, which is uh, negative for the first two periods. This is like a, a bit uh, slightly uh, more um, like uh, larger impact compared to Canada. And then to summarize for super good, there is indeed a cyclicality in the effects of the fascinating index in economic activity and income uh, functional income distribution. Uh, in case of the unemployment rate, it's a very uh, a longer impact. Uh, that is seven years on average. <clears throat> then we have also a very important impact of the fascinating index on distribution um, uh, the labor share. And uh, we can conclude that monetary policy rule that follows PI, the fascinating must consider the short run impacts of the unemployment rate on the distribution of income and that coordination of fiscal policy is an imperative. And ideally, monetary policy will follow in a fascinating, it should be allowed as a general and um, flexible framework. And um, 
Well, the uh, these interest, the Pazinelli were the uh, and these other actually there are other interest rate rules out there. You know, there's the Smith and Rule, Kansas City rules, and other. Uh, I mean, the, the Pazinelli uh, rule should be taken as a much more general framework to the uh, reason in the conduct of monetary policy. We shouldn't apply it mechanically. You know, that's the whole point I was asking. You know, we can just apply it mechanically then. You can get into a lot of problems, that's what I see. You know, in, 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 you know, uh, but uh, clearly, uh, it should be coordinated for sure. You know, and it should be coordinated in a way that we're dealing ultimately with the macroeconomic objectives of employment and growth and all that, you know, at the end as well. Now, given the, uh, the lag effects, you know, uh, we obviously, uh, you know that things work out through you know, they work themselves out through time here, like the rest of the law. Some of them are pretty long and interesting. And we gotta work through the consequences of that as well. Uh, not to have the, the more destabilizing effects as well. And and these, of course, do not in any way negate what uh, you know what has been the most Keynesian position, which is that we should pursue that fiscal policy as a stabilization rule. And that monetary policy, of course, could complement it, but it should not run the show, you know, should not be the uh, run the show, so to speak, here, which is what we have in these inflation targets at kind the of, kind of regimes, of course, not, not at all. Okay. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, what we do say is that the evidence does uh, suggest that uh, monetary policy is hardly ineffective, it does impact it at a certain level. And that, and therefore, one should be uh, concerned about you know just putting everything on an automatic pilot here. That's the point, here. because it can have certain long, longer term, you know, consequences and effectiveness. And that applies to all of them. It's the Smith and Rule as well. Under the Smith and Rule, uh, depending on which one there, but it's still you just fix the real rate here at some point. And uh, on the other Kansas City, which is fix the interbank rate at zero. You know, so th this is an issue, and. Obviously, uh, our point was that we should altogether abandon uh, discretionary policy as a tool here, but it should be adopted in a way that is more kind of incremental because we're taking into consideration the effects that it has uh, over a certain uh, period of uh, the business cycle. Which means, of course, it necessarily does not mean that discretionary monetary policy over the business cycle should not be implemented to achieve, you know. A lot of the goals like full employment and so on, uh, because of these bad effects that they were talking about. But uh, what we were finding, of course, is that it does have that cyclical impact, and we should be concerned about it. That's the point, right? And depending on where you are in this sort of cyclical cycle, was here, you, you could either be more destabilizing or less. And the uh, our findings, I think, uh, reinforce what we were arguing in that 22 paper in GI, that uh, where we argued that you know that we should use it with discretion, of course, but also carefully and don't you know, I, I, what's the term here? Uh, it's to uh, be careful because handle with care here you know, in a sense, but you should nonetheless be uh, pursuing. Uh, the discretionary part, uh, at least that's what our, our point was. That there, there's some uh, there's a, there's room for that, you know, within the short term. Yeah. Even though the objective should be the same in the long term. Thank you very much.